Um, right, so the last three subjects we have covered in um, kind of reverse chronological order was trial bids last week, before that end plays, and before that control bidding. So I've not really written them in a <laughs> very useful order, <laughs> nothing to do with chronology there. Um, so I'm, I'll cover them top down. Um, for those of you who are here, obviously you'll have sort of heard this before, but it's always good to cover them again. If you have any questions, I'll try to break it into three kind of pauses, if you will, so you can question on each, or all of them, or whatever. <laughs> So, uh, trial bids. Now, trial bids is a, obviously, a bidding um, agreement between you and your partner. It's when you are the opening side, and it's when your bidding has started with one of a major, two of a major. It specifically applies to this kind of bidding scenario. Only one of a major raised to two of a major. Not as an overcaller, only as an opener, and it's only in the major suits. So it's quite a specific scenario, but the idea behind it is that often you are in a question mark territory as to whether you want to be in game or not. Sometimes you think, yeah, I'll just bid four spades, my hand's good enough. Sometimes you think, well, I think game's dodgy, I might, I want to invite. And sometimes you think game is definitely not on. So it's not difficult when you're in the definitely no and definitely yes world. They are not difficult worlds to be in. Don't bid it or bid it. That's basically the premise. When you're in the maybe world, what a kind of standard thing to do would be to bid three spades. Because pass would be, I don't want to be in game. Four spades would be, let's play in game. So three spades kind of logically makes sense to be the invitational bit. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a bit of a waste. And the reason it's a bit of a waste is because you have bypassed a lot of bids along the way. So what trial bids are, they, they look to make use of the bids you have not bid, i.e. three clubs, three diamonds, and three hearts in this instance. You might as well use those bids to describe things about your hand. Because you're bidding on beyond two spades, you are invitational. And because you aren't bidding four spades, you are not game going. So you are somewhere in the middle. Points range is sort of 16, 17-ish, that kind of region where you like that about game. If you're on balance, it's more about like a six loser, where you're on the cusp. Five losers just go for it, seven losers don't bother looking. So six loser is in the middle. Uh, this hand is a touch strong for it, but I'll explain why in a minute. So what the one spade, two spades, three spades lacks is, I suppose, kind of science. It, it's not very descriptive. It just kind of goes, you bid four, then I'll blame you. Don't bid four, and we make it, I'll blame you. It's kind of passing the book, really. So what trial bids are is you bid a side suit. You don't bid a side suit as a natural bid. You bid a side suit to describe your hand further, i.e. it doesn't mean you have four cards in that suit. The reason you don't need three clubs or three diamonds or three hearts as natural bids is because you have already found your fit. So you are playing in spades. You're not arguing about whether spades should be trumps or not. You're just deciding on the level. So therefore, three clubs, diamonds, and hearts are not saying, should this suit be trumps? Because there's no point in that. What they are saying is something specific. Now, when I refer to a trial bid, I'm talking about long suit trial bids. There are a version known as short suit trial bids. But no one plays them. I suppose that's wrong. One in a hundred people who play trial bids play the short version. So whenever I say trial bid, I mean long suit, which is the most normal way of playing it. And a trial bid is given the name, trying for game. And what it says is, I am worried about this suit. So typically you have three losers in that suit. You have a suit that you are worried about. You are kind of, not obsessing, but you're looking at your hand thinking, game might not be on because of X. And whatever X is, is the suit you're worried about. So in this instance, I'm worried about diamonds. I think four spades might not make because the opponents might get off to a very quick start with diamond, 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 if my partner can't help me. So typically, a trial bid, the suit that you bid, says, I have three small cards in this suit. That might be three or more small cards. It might be three small cards with an honor. You have cards that you need to do something with. Ace to four, king to four, three small, Three to the jack, I suppose, is just as, the same as three small, really. A suit that you think there are plenty of losers there if your partner puts down three small as well. So what this does is it both invites your partner to bid game or not, but also describes something about your hand, so your partner knows how well their hand is suiting your hand. It's more, it's more of an intelligent way of looking for game. So your partner now, after the trial bid, Bids four spades if they can help you in your trial suit, and bids three spades if they can't. And help would be a one loser suit or fewer. So ace doubleton, that's one loser. King doubleton, one loser. Singleton, one loser. Ace, on its own, no losers. 
something where you think there is a one loser suit, ace king x, ace queen x, king queen x, where you where you would count one loser doing a normal losing trick count. The reason that is useful is because if your partner has a three loser suit, you can cut those losers down by two. That should mean your hands are going well together because they are strong where you are weak, and the vice versa should probably be true. Given you've got an invitational hand, if you are particularly weak in one suit, you should be pretty decent in the other suits. That's the implication. Now what this does is it means you sometimes get to game when the traditional one spade, two spades, three spades would not get you to game. Just show you an example. Um, I mean, I appreciate South might not be on this hand, but you never know. So, North opens one spade. South's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine losers. Nine losers opposite seven losers is 16, so they should raise their partners one spade to two spades. They're bidding two spades on shape, not points. Obviously, they've only got four points. So, they're bidding two spades <coughs> because they've just about scraped it because of this singleton diamond. Okay, with me so far? Yeah? yeah. So, they bid two spades. If their partner were to bid three spades as a generic bid game please if you're maximum, pass if you're not bid, which isn't very descriptive, South would pass, wouldn't they? They are sub-minimum, you could argue. They would pass very quickly, probably pass before they bid. They're so keen to pass. If you actually trial bid, what it says is, I'm worried about this suit, can you help me? Now, South can help them in the one suit that North has trial bid in, obviously, because I've set that up. But now you can see, if you just look at these two hands in play, they're going to lose one diamond, one club maybe, if the club queen is not finessing, and one spade maybe, if the king of spades is not finessing. So 10 tricks should be the minimum they can make. If the king of spades loses and the queen of clubs loses, the diamond is a definite loser. So you've got kind of 10, 11 or 12 tricks depending on how <coughs> sunny it was that day. So game is a certainty, yet you are not going to get there without descriptive bids like the trial bid. And what South realises with North trial bid is yes, I can help you where you are weak. I have the hand you want me to have, which is, sorry, which is shortage here. Or big cards there. Either or. With that, South should then bid four spades, which you would never bid without trial bids. Mm. So the idea is you're being more intelligent about the way you're talking to one another. Rather than just bid four or don't, you're actually saying bid four if you can help me here. It's quite a specific message, which is very useful. Um, you could argue with North's hand, they've got 18 points, shouldn't they just be bidding four spades? Okay, I understand where you're going with that. And yes, you could argue that you could blast four spades. Given that you have got trial bids, I think you should probably just use them because this suit is a perfect trial bid suit. Fancy that, that's the one I've put on the board. Um, I suppose you could argue, yeah, just blast four spades. Fair enough, that, that's also an argument. Um, I suppose if I decrease the clubs maybe or something you might then be in, in trial bid world. I think 16, 17-ish points is where you want to be trial bidding or a 6 loser. So this is a touch strong but it, it, it has the perfect trial bid suit if you like. So essentially when you've agreed a major, three, well a new suit, not always a three level, a new suit is can you help me in this suit? The answer is yes I have a one loser suit or better or no I have too many losers in that suit. So if I change it to that you now don't accept the trial because you have two losers in that suit. Do you see? Yeah. What, what if you had like nine points for you at the top end of your team? Okay. Let's make it, let's fix it. And you had two losers. Two losers in this suit. Yeah, is that? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, that's going to be too many points. Let's take that away. So that. I would probably turn down the trial just because it makes it black and white then. Yeah. Um, you could treat it as, oh well it's too good not to bid four, you just bid four. <coughs> but I think you should respect the trial. But here you're going to lose two diamonds and a club, so game is on a, on a spade finesse. So it's not an unrealistic contract, but I think you should respect the trial. But change it to that. And you're definitely bidding it now because it's a one loser suit again. Mm. Yeah. And now you are losing one diamond, one club, so you're plus one on the finesse. Um, yeah, I think just, just treat it as normal, but I understand the point. Now, moving very nicely, if I keep that north hand on there, 
change to South Ham, obviously, otherwise we'd still be in trial big world. Control bidding is a bit like... Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah, sorry, I didn't ask yeah, that. Sorry, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't it? yeah. So if, if you had a, a long minor, um, mm -hmm. would you not try to go to three new counts? If it was minor, minor. If well, it was so one of the minor, two of minor. Five spades and uh, four diamonds, and you've got five diamonds, you've got nine diamonds. It wouldn't state. start. If that was the case, I would have been two states already, so trial bids never exist. So, so you never go into a minor with trial bid then? No. So never, then you never go into three no trumps? No, because you've agreed a major. If it goes one major, two major, three no yes. trumps should yes. never be an option. I mean, there are times where you want to be in 3N, but it's more likely to cause you upset trying to play in 3N sometimes. Just play four in major. Or three, depending on what you want to be in the game. So, if it were to go one state, three states, if you like, control bidding is like trial bidding's bigger brother. Because you are using the side suits, but instead of looking for game or not, you're looking for slam or not. So control bidding are similar-ish to trial bids, but rather than showing a suit you are worried about, control bidding shows where you have control, hence the name. And the control bid says, I have the first round of control in this suit. If the opponents lead this suit, I will win the first trick. It's a promise, if you like. So what control bidding does is it talks about the aces and kings you have in your hand, again to evaluate whether your hands are fitting nicely together or not. It's all about how nicely, I think, it's all about how nicely your hands are going together as to how many tricks you make. You can have 30 points and slam have no chance. You can have 22 points and slam be easy. It's about how nicely your hands are going together. So that's what trial bids and control bids look to kind of solve. So one spade, three spades. Now it makes no sense for four clubs to be a trial bid because you have just bid at the four level. So if you, are, if you wanted to not be in game, it's too late. You're in at least four spades. So therefore, bidding beyond, bidding making your side have game as a minimum means a new suit is a control bid instead. So what you need to do a control bid is you need to be in a game going hand, a game forced situation, and you need to have a fit. You need to have a fit somewhere so you know where you're going, whether that's in diamonds or clubs, or more often than not, hearts or spades. So the reason four clubs is a control bid is because four spades is the minimum number of spades now. So you are game forced. You're going to game with this bid. So it doesn't make sense for this bid to say, I'm worried about clubs, do you think we should be in four or not? Because you're now in four whether you like it or not. So once you get beyond that barrier of part score, which this is the barrier, isn't it? If you go beyond this, you're going in four now. Any bit of a new suit there is a control bid. Now, control bidding actually comes up more frequently after a game forcing bid from the responder straight away. Our favourite friend, Jacoby Two No Trumps. Jacoby Two No Trumps <coughs> ticks both the boxes for control bidding. Control bidding, you need to be game forced and you need to have a fit. And Jacoby does both of those things in one bid. It says, I like your suit and I think game's the minimum. This is a natural sequence where control bidding would make sense to follow. So three clubs here, again, would not be a trial bid because this bid has forced your side to gain. Four spades is the minimum contract. So North can never get out in three spades as much as they dislike their hand. Even if they go, oh, I missed count, I've only got eight points. Tough, you're in game. You've lied already, you've got to continue with it, kind of thing. So, because <laughs> you just can't get out. Your partner's game four. They're not going to stop. They are not going to stop short of game. That's what they're telling you here. Assuming you've agreed you're playing Jacoby, of course. So when you, make, when you bid control bidding, um, it just says, I have the ace of this suit. And you have a little bit like a rally, where it goes, I've got the ace of this, I've got the ace of this, I've got the ace of this. Oh, good, let's go for slam. The idea behind it is to dip your toes, if you like, in the pool of slam without diving in. Four no trumps would be to dive in. You're going into slam territory there. <coughs> control bidding is a way of having a mild conversation about it without committing. The beauty of control bidding is that you can go backwards and forwards and then if you want you can bail out so if you see here i mean we're just going kind of as most as efficiently as we can we've got kind of what like seven bids there and we are still not yet at game level we're not at four spades yet so if for some reason south gets cold feet and bids four spades and trying to play i mean they shouldn't given the amount of positivity going on here but if south thinks no oh, game's the limit you can get out Whereas if you go one spade, four spades, four no trumps, the minimum you can get out in is five spades, and you have a lot less info. So it's actually more efficient. It's all about using the room and talking about how nice your hands are together. So in this world, um, two, two no trumps agreed spades and said we're game going, which means control bidding now makes sense. Ace of clubs, ace of diamonds, ace of hearts, king of clubs, king of hearts. 
So when you've once control bid, the next time you bid that suit, whether it's you or your partner, it shows the king. So you're essentially just talking about the big cards in your hand. If you get enough rounds of control bidding, you can actually get to a position where you could almost write down your partner's hand on a piece of paper. That's what we're looking to get at. Appreciate that's extreme like, overkill, if you will. But being able to control bid all like backwards and forwards like this and then bid four spades is, well, if you want to, not that you would in this instance, is, is a really useful tool to be able to explore slime without committing to it. Now, there are things with control bids that are slightly, not unusual, but you just need to be aware of. If your partner fails to control bid a suit, that means they have not got the first round control in that suit. Because they bypassed something, they should have done that first. So if South has the Ace of Diamonds, they should have bid three <coughs> diamonds first, in preference to doing something else, because three diamonds was their next bid. It's all about efficiency, trying to slot each of the bids on top of one another. Now here, South bid three spades, which shows the Ace of Spades in theory, but we have the Ace of Spades. So the, the kind of special thing about control bidding is you can't control bid the trump suit. The reason for that is if you bid four spades, that is not I have the ace of spades, it's I want to play in four spades. You need the trump suit as an escape mechanism. So you can only actually control it in these side suits, in this case diamonds, hearts and clubs. So three spades here, all that does is it says I haven't got the ace of diamonds and I haven't got the ace of hearts. Okay? You never say anything about the specific suit you're bidding when you're bidding the trump suit, but you might be denying something. So the thing that makes control bidding more difficult than it seems is the things that they are denying as well as showing. They're, they're bypassing things, which denies X and Y, but then showing things as well. So you've got to think carefully about how you're kind of stepping on top of one of those bits. So in this instance, South is saying they do not have the Ace of Diamonds. So immediately, as North, I will be starting to worry about the Diamond suit. Because now it's looking like Diamond losers are coming, doesn't it? We are at least losing one Diamond, quite possibly, slash probably, two diamonds. So suddenly slam is starting to fade immediately, and we're not yet past three no trumps. So sometimes control bidding is good in the negative way, which sounds silly, but it's good in the way it keeps you out of a silly slam, because you have dodged the ace-king of a side suit missing. So in this instance, north might bid four hearts, and now south knows north hasn't got anything in diamonds either, and suddenly the elephant in the room is presenting itself. So if South doesn't have anything in diamonds at all, North knows, sorry, South knows that North hasn't, and North will know when South hasn't, because they'll try and sign off in four spades now. So control bidding can be useful when you don't go for slam. It's a useful thing to kind of dip your toe in and go, ooh, don't like that. So it's not always a glorified way of bidding four no trumps. Sometimes it's a way of not having to use four no trumps because you found out early doors. All right? So in this instance, let's say South's got three diamonds to the jack or something, they'd be like, okay, let's stay well away from that slap. If they do have three small diamonds, that means their game going hand sort of has to be like king, queen, queen, king, something where they've got lots of points that aren't in diamonds. So you won't have any losers apart from in diamonds. So whenever you are a game forced, whenever your side is game forced and you have a fit, if you bid a side suit, it is not necessarily natural. You don't need it to be natural because you have agreed whatever suit you've agreed. And if, it, if you are in a game force scenario, it makes sense for those bits to be controlled bits. I have ace of this, I have ace of that. Be aware of what your partners bypass as well as what they have bit themselves. It's easier to know, oh, they've got the ace of diamonds, but they might have denied the ace of clubs as well. So it's good to pick up both bits of information, not just what they've bit. Okay? Right, any questions on that? Are on those control bits alertable? Uh, it depends on what level. Helpful answer. Oh, okay. um, if they're below three no trumps, yes. If they're above three no trumps, only if it's on the first round, which so would be highly unlikely. Three alertable. clubs, three diamonds would be alertable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because they are not natural bids at the three level. The rules are: if they're below three no trumps and they're not natural, they need alerting. If they're above three no trumps, they only need alerting if it's your first round bid. Doesn't really to, to catch splinters and stuff like that. I guess. Oh. So um, control bidding only from ages ago. Is it? Uh, you can get to control bidding in a minor, but you don't have jack to bid. So again, yes, everything is structured around majors, of course. Right. But um, there is a way to get to control bidding on a minor suit, and that is to strongly agree a minor. So the two kind of sequences that spring to mind here, two clubs start, that often gets you to a minor contract, if the two clubber has a minor. So let's say two clubs, three clubs, four clubs. Mm -hmm. that, that's game forcing, that agrees plus, four diamonds will be a control. So you can do it on a minor. 
Or another sequence that would spring to mind to get in, into minor control bidding would be one note trump or two note trumps and a jump to a minor. Three clubs or four clubs. A jump to a minor should be a slam suit, slam interested hand with that suit of trumps. Three diamonds would be a control. And voids count as first round controls. Voids can be first round controls as well, but you, if you assume it's an ace, you're right about 19 times out of 20, somewhere in that region. It could be a void. And you will know sometimes when you've got the ace and your partner showing control. But more often than not, it's the ace or the king, depending on which first or second they're showing. Um, it, yeah, it isn't a void very frequently, but it can be some of the time. Okay, any more? No, good. Right. Now, last one. Probably the oh, I should have picked the option there. Mm -hmm. Last one. This is probably the trickiest one. Uh, I don't know. <coughs> procrastinating that one to the end. Um, so, end of the play. So, let's. Uh, <coughs> Let's give you a different one. The one for those of you who are here, you won't see uh, for the end play, you won't seen this one before, but let's try it anyway. Um, okay. Jumping back, if, if East and West had had intervened, is, is, is the previous two being just all odds? Uh, pretty much yes. Pretty much yes. You can agree to play Jack the after an intervention. Uh, if they double, you can ignore them in a sense. Uh, if they bid something, often it interrupts you. So more often than not, it will mean you need to revert to natural bidding. Um, but there are sort of special scenarios where you don't have to, and by agreement. But typically, yes. Um, so, end plays. Now, end plays is a card play technique specifically for declarers. You can end play a declarer as a defender, but it's very difficult to manufacture because you need to know everything, which is not easy as a defender. As a declarer, an end play comes up more frequently because you can see all your team's assets. And the idea behind an end play is to try and manipulate the opponents to lead a suit for you. So the idea behind it is to give the opponents the lead at a critical juncture, i.e. timing is important, well, in everything with an end play. And what you have to do is relinquish the lead to them in a specific suit or time where they have to lead something that helps you. So they, whenever the opponents lead a suit, they are guaranteed to be helping you or it certainly won't be worsening your chances because whenever they lead a suit, they are playing first and third to a trick rather than second and fourth. Playing second and fourth is a natural advantage which is a natural advantage the defenders have more often than the declarer, because the declarer wins more tricks, typically. So giving the opponent the lead is an underrated and underused tactic to try and generate extra tricks. Yes, you have to lose a trick. So obviously if you're in a grand slam, end plays isn't going to work, because you have to lose the lead. But if you're in kind of game or a small slam, losing the lead at a critical time means the opponent sometimes can't help but give you tricks, because they have to lead something that helps you. Now what an end play is, is specifically manufacturing the circumstances where they cannot stop but help you. They can't do anything but help you. Because if they lead X, Y or Z, they are giving you a trick in some way, shape or form. It's quite a difficult technique because it requires a lot of setup. There's a lot of setup and then you give them the lead at this really kind of the perfect time and then they have to lead something. So, the way an end play often kind of reveals itself is when you've got hands that are quite mirrored, hands that look similar to one another in shape. So this particular hand, I've just made it up, so let's see if it works, but this particular hand is not perfectly mirrored, but you can see how it's quite close. We're not many cards away from mirrored shape. The reason mirrored shape works well for end plays is because when you lose the lead, which is known as the throw, you want to make it that you've voided yourself of suits you don't want them to lead. So what's the, the first part of an end play is known as the elimination. You eliminate options for the opponents. You remove suits from your hand so they can't lead that suit because you'll trump them. And then you give them the lead in another suit and they have to either lead that suit for you or lead one of the suits you'll trump. So an elimination is followed by a throw-in and eliminations are easier when your hands are mirrored. So the way to spot an end play being a potential is when you have mirrored shape. Hands that look similar to one another in shape. Often a disadvantage when they're mirrored actually can work into an advantage if you can manufacture an empire. So, if we just look at this, let's say we are in, let's say we're in six spades, that's a challenge. Um, and we have got no losers in spades, no losers in diamonds, no losers in clubs. 
I'm going to rough that club here, I'm going to rough that diamond there. There should be no losers other than in the heart suit. Okay? I hope we all agree, because uh, you can't really lose anything other than heart. Now the problem we might have is that we might lose two hearts. We might lose a queen and the king. So there are certain ways where we wouldn't lose two hearts. That would be a singleton heart honour. That would be nice, because you play the ace on the king. Hooray, you've only lost one, the queen. Uh, that, that would be kind of Christmas time. Um, the other ways we might not lose two hearts is if one of the heart honours is here, so we trap it underneath our ace jack by taking a finesse and then another finesse and just finesse them to high heavens. The only other time is if we could get them to lead hearts for us. So if they would lead hearts for us, we might be able to make our jack and our ace individually and then we don't care about the first trick. If the opponents lead a heart for us, either they lead a big one, which you kill with your ace, or they lead a small one, which means you have a chance <coughs> of making your jack. Can you see here, if we just leave the heart suit in isolation, imagine there's three cards left, everyone's got three hearts in their hand. You want them to lead it for you, not you. Do you see that? Because if you lead it for yourself, you have only really one option, finesse and then finesse again, which is taking a chance. If they lead the hearts for you, actually you sort of can't go wrong, because whatever they do, you kill it or you win your jack. So they, they can't stop you as long as they lead the suit. So what you need to do to get to that end position is to get rid of the side suits. So the first part of an end play is to actually, well, firstly recognise that an end play might be on, but eliminate the suits that you don't want them to be leading. So if we lose the lead now, let's say we lost the lead at trick one and go, lead a heart for me, they're not going to do that. They're going to lead a club, a diamond, or a spade. So you need to stop them from leading a club, a diamond, or a spade. And you need to eliminate them. Now I'm going to imagine east on lead to this six space doesn't lead a heart. If they lead a heart, they've done it for us. So I'm going to imagine they aren't doing that, just to make it so we actually have to do something. Let's say they lead something completely safe, like a minor honour. So we have to win the trick. Now, first part of the end play is recognise where your loser is. So your loser is your throw-in card, your exit card. That is the second part of the end play. The loser that you are going to lose. If you don't have a definite loser, you haven't got an end play because it means you could win the whole lot. So why are you bothering losing? If you do have a definite loser, here we must lose a heart trick. Even if the king and queen both are with west, we still must lose a heart trick. We can't avoid it. That's just life because we're missing the king and queen. So our exit card is going to be in this heart suit. The, and then the second part of recognising end play is noticing you've got the mirrored shape and then creating the elimination, kind of forcing the rest of the cards out of your hand so you only end up with trumps and the suit that you're interested in, in this case hearts. So let's draw the trumps. Just to save me circling three rounds, I'm going to say they break 2-2, two, two, but you don't need a 2-2 two, two break here, it's just because I'm lazy. So that's all the trumps drawn. Now we want to eliminate the side suits. So, king of diamonds, rough a diamond, I don't care what the opponents are doing, they'll be following suit or not, whatever. Um, hang on, let me think about this, I need to be a little bit careful with what I'm doing. Hang on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got to be careful with the entries, sorry. Wow. This, is, this is how tricky they are. Wow. Yeah, I've not, I've not planned it, I've just been thinking. <laughs> well, so, clubs first, ace of clubs, I'll tell you why in a minute. Low club to the king, and rough your final club. So in, what we've done there is we've eliminated clubs. Now you could argue, well surely the opponents still have clubs in their hand. Well they do, don't they? Because we only had five, so one opponent, at least, more likely both of them, have clubs in their hand. But if they happen to lead a club for us now, you can throw a loser away, here, and trump it down here. You see that? That's known as a rough and discard. That means that you have made a trump on its own and discarded a loser all in one trick. That's a net gain of two. Because you've made a trump, good, and you've got rid of a loser, good. Rough and discard. So they can't leave clubs now because you've eliminated clubs. So when you get rid of a suit in both hands and you are in a trump contract, that suit is eliminated because you can rough and throw away. Now we need to eliminate the diamonds in the same manner. King of diamonds, rough a diamond. Now the reason Oh, I've already circled it from previously. The reason um, I did the clubs first was so that when I'd eliminated diamonds, I was now in the south hand. You've got to be a little bit careful where your lead is. As ever, entries is a really important thing. Because now we have eliminated clubs and diamonds. Do you see that? Now, if the opponents lead a club or a diamond, we trump it here and we throw our loser there, and then we only have one loser. Do you see that? Yeah. They lead a club, play the queen of spades, throw our small heart, we lose one heart, that's it. Lead a diamond, exactly the same thing. 
If they need a heart, good, they're doing the finesse for us. So we created a situation where they can't leave clubs or downs. They could never really lead hearts because that had to help us. And they haven't got spades in their hand. So when you lose the lead, they now can't lead a club, a diamond, a heart, or a spade. <laughs> they can't win. So when you now lead a heart, the ten, let's say, if they play an honour on it, play your ace, you've only lost one trick. <coughs> whichever one they don't play. If they play low, which is their only chance, I appreciate they played a lot more cards here in the minors, I'm not bothered about that. <coughs> now you play low, East wins whatever they win, the king, and now East has the lead. They can't lead a club or a diamond, because if they lead a club or a diamond, you trump with a queen of spades, you throw your jack of hearts away, and you have the rest of the tricks. If they throw a heart, if they lead a heart, you play small, they play the queen, you beat it, they don't play the queen, you win the jack. You see that? Now obviously, I've manufactured the hands, and I made a mistake, so they're not easy, these end plays, but I've created the hands so the kind of an end play works. But the way behind an end play is to, instead of you trying to manufacture your own tricks, you give them the lead at a certain time, and they can't help but give you tricks. Now I want to point out, you can't always perfect an end play like this, where you envisage the entire 13 tricks. Sometimes you're kind of 89 tricks in and you think, I don't know what to do, so I'll just give them the lead with this definite loser. Let's see what they do. That's, if you like, kind of a pseudo end play, where you just throw them the lead and, and think, well, if they lead me one of them, that helps me. The defenders aren't all knowing. They won't know that you don't want them to lead X or Y. They will sometimes lead something that actually helps you, whether that's through force or through a misdefense. It doesn't mean you have manufactured this kind of perfection. If you're ever struggling in a contract, giving the lead away is a massively underrated tool. Because you feel like if you're struggling, surely losing tricks is bad. And the answer is, well, yes, if you lose the rest of the tricks, that's bad. But losing a single trick often can actually generate more tricks for your side. Bird in the hand, two in the bush, kind of thing. Okay? Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to just go, all oh, right, I see all end plays, I'm just going to do this, 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 eliminate them, throw you in, haha, 12 tricks. But noticing an end play is noticing mirrored shape and basically just ad taking advantage of the opponent having to win a trick. You must have a definite loser. In this instance, we definitely had a loser in hearts. We're trying to avoid two. So we had a definite loser. Lose that at a critical juncture where they then have to help you. That's what an end play looks to do. Okay? But they are not easy. I'm not going to tell you they are easy because they're not. As you would expect, there are end plays in there. So if you do play in a hand where you suspect an end play was kind of the right way to play, call me over if you can at the time, and I'll try and explain if you didn't make it. Of course, some of you might pull it off. Okay?